Riding in winter conditions means different things depending where you're based geographically. If you're based in Europe, that's gonna mean riding in wet and muddy conditions. So there's gonna be a bunch of things you need to do to your bike in order to look after it and make sure it stays running smoothly all winter. This is what I like to do to mine to get the best out of it. As with any process when you're working on your bike, you have to be quite systematic about the, the approach that you take to it. So I'm gonna start by doing my seat post first, then I can hang it in the work stand and then work around the rest of the bike. Now, the biggest thing you really need to do for winter is apply fresh lubricant and fresh grease to the bike. And it's not for the purpose of lubrication on the actual bearings, it's more to act as a barrier. You think with heavy duty grease, it's a water repellent and it's ideal for keeping moisture and stuff away from delicate parts, moving parts. I'm gonna start here with the seat post because this is one of the first entries to the frame it can damage other things like bearings, for example, when water finds its way in. Now this is a carbon frame and as a result of that, I've got assembly compound in here already, which means I don't have to over torque the bolt, but I'm gonna put some fresh carbon safe grease around the top just to act as a barrier. And whilst we're here working on the seat post, I'm also gonna pay attention to the seal of the dropper post. Now it's effectively the same as a fork seal. So this is like a stanchion tube, compresses into the outer tube here. As a result of that, when it's covered in dirt and grime and water, you can get some of that finding its way into the post. So by applying some fresh grease and lube to the inside of this seal, it's gonna basically act as a water repellent. It's exactly what you want for those wet months. Okay, so I'm just gonna be cleaning this area here. Fresh grease and then putting it back in place. So I'm just putting some of this part grease around the frame here, just around the top. Now, of course, because this is a carbon frame, it has to be a carbon safe grease, but I already know that this one is fine to use, so it's no problem. And again, I'm emphasizing, this is just to act as a barrier here, just to help stop water getting into the frame itself. I put the collar back in place there. There we go. And then I can tighten my seat collar back up. And just wipe off the excess there. Now, depending on the model of dropper post you have, it's going to vary. But on these Crank Brothers ones, it's quite simple just to actually undo by hand, counterclockwise or anti clockwise and just remove the seal completely and that exposes the bush, which is underneath here. Here we go. Now I'm just gonna lower the post slightly and then let it come back up again, there we go. And you can see the top bushing here. Now I'm gonna use some fork safe lubricant here. So this is specifically designed to be used on fork seals. This is effectively a fork seal. So just gonna give this a wipe and put some fresh lube down the top of the post here. Now, of course, when applying oil to any area of the bike, make sure it can't get anywhere near your braking surfaces. This is obviously, I'm just applying this by hand, so it's not a spray, so I don't have to worry about that too much. But still, using a rag just to catch any of the excess there. I'm just gonna slide that bush back into place there. And then a little bit more on the top side of that, which will be underneath the main seal, and then, slide that back into place and secure it. And then you'll find it actually works a lot smoother as well. And we're gonna be repeating a similar process with a fork. If I can just compress this now, it's gonna be nice and smooth. You'll get a bit of initial oil come out of the seal there. It's just doing its job. As you can see, there's a little ring of it around the top of the tube here. Wipe that excess off and that's good to go for winter. Now, if you've got a full suspension bike, you're just gonna have one of two types of back end on it. You'll have one that's got bearings as part of each pivot, or it's gonna have bushings in there. This particular bike has bushings on that. They're very lightweight and they don't need greasing, really. They kind of take care of themselves as long, of course, as they're nice and clean and they're not worn in the first place. But if your bike has full bearings on the back, then you can do the same principle, applying additional grease to the outside surfaces that wards off that water that can wear them out. And of course, you're gonna be washing your bike more over winter. So the more water gets near that stuff, the more likelihood there is for it to wear the bearings out. So any barrier grease you can apply to these areas is fantastic. But just bear in mind that when you do apply the grease, make sure you wipe off the excess because it does also attract grit, which can wear stuff out. 
So just take a bit of time and just make it a nice, neat job. Everywhere you apply the stuff, bottom bracket bearings, headset bearings, that's a place where it harbors moisture around there, such a big tube. And of course, there's also entrance to the frame as well. So another reason to try and stop that moisture getting in there. So whenever I'm doing this process, I try not to remove the whole fork from the bike. You obviously can, and you can get more grease in there, but let's not forget, this is just a quick process before getting out riding really. So I'm gonna remove the stem and I'm just gonna let that dangle down carefully on the cables. Remove those top spacers. And I'm just gonna let the headset drop down. Give it a quick wipe of the rag and I'm gonna apply a whole load of fresh grease on the top here. Don't be shy with the stuff. Again, it's a barrier to protect and stop getting moisture and stuff on the inside. I actually look pretty good in here at the moment, but wash in a load of fresh grease all the way around and the same for that crown race as well. And you'll find it's gonna purge back out again when you slip it back into the frame, but you can wipe up the excess, so that's no problem. Here we go, slide this down. Space is back on, stem back on the top. GMBN top cap, of course, on my particular bike. And just before I line it up and make sure it's all set, I'm just gonna wipe up all that Messy excess. So just like we looked at the dropper post seals earlier on, it's a really good idea to take a look at your fork seals. Now suspension fork itself takes a lot of abuse. It moves so much constantly and they do sort of ingest muck, mud and moisture in their time. Now the fork seals themselves are fairly simple. So this is an example seal. The metal spring, that's called a garter spring that goes around the top there. So you can do a really nice fast version for getting some suspension dedicated lubricant into the fork seal area. And that is just to pop that garter spring up, use a very fine screwdriver and be very careful. You do not scratch that stanchion tube. You don't want to be doing that. And then get the blunt end of a cable tie and you can slide it past this just to break that seal and just drop some oil all the way around the seal, cycle the fork and you'll find it pulls out a lot of the bad stuff that's in there. And of course it adds moisture by lubrication to it as well. If you want to go a step further, you want to do a fork lower leg service. Now this is a whole process within itself. You get these foam seals and the idea of these is they're soaked in suspension lubricant and they sit underneath those seals to keep the seal lubricated, which makes the fork work nicely and of course creates that barrier. So the whole job of basically the suspension lube is to make sure the fork works nicely, it's nice and slick, nice and clean. Ideally, what you wanna be doing with your suspension fork is keeping it clean and lubricated. That's the fundamentals to make sure it's gonna stay working well. The next step is to look at doing the lower legs themselves. And it's a fairly simple process and it's pretty much the same on all forks. Now this is just the quick version, so I've just removed the two nuts from the base of the fork. Using those nuts and a soft mallet, just shock them to make sure the inner tubes are separated from the outers. And as you can see here, some oil is already draining out, so make sure you've got a drip tray or something to catch it at the bottom there. And I'm just gonna slide those lowers down. And there we go. And that oil, which is just lubrication oil, will drain out. And simply put, I'm just gonna replace it with a syringe. very carefully so you don't purge any more of that oil out. Slide the lowers all the way back on. Now it's just a case of simply putting these foot nuts and seals back in place as you remove them from the fork and tighten into manufacturer's torque settings. And just replace that rebound knob. Adjust the little grub screw that holds it in place and put the protective cover back in place. And you'll find those forks feel amazing now. And of course, all that extra oil keeps all the moisture at bay. If you want to do the cheats version like I'm doing here, I'm just draining out the old oil and I'm going to replace it with fresh oil. Depending on which forks you have, there's a specified amount of oil you need for each leg. In this particular fork, a Fox 36 is 10 cc's in the air leg and 40 cc's in the damper leg. And any decent fork lubricant will suffice for this. Fox recommend is a 20 weight. Uh, this particular one I've got here is a Whistler Performance Lubes. Lower leg lube, 20 weight, job done. So when you do a fork 
full lower leg service, you take obviously the lowers off. You get access to the seals, which you can obviously clean, put some fresh seal grease underneath there. Seal is this part here at the top. The foam ring is this part here. And then underneath the part that you definitely don't want to scratch, that is the bushing. That's what enables the fork to slide up and down. Those foam rings that I showed you earlier, those nice clean ones. Let's have a look at one that's been doing its job for a few months. Look at the difference. So it's possible to renovate these basically to like clean them out and put fresh oil in. But the best thing to do really is to soak them in the oil rather than just applying the oil. It's a little messier, but it makes, makes them that little bit slippier on the fork stanchion tubes. So if you do take your fork lowers off completely, give those seals a full clean, make sure those foam rings have got loads of oil on them, because it's gonna make them feel amazing. And just get some fork seal grease and just smear some of that just under the seal there. Again, every little you do will help make them feel a lot better for a lot longer and keep horrible mucky water, grimy paste away from the delicate internals. Now, although the rear shock of your bike is actually better sealed than a fork is, you might still wanna do the same process to your shock as well. Now, for removing the air sleeve itself, it's really handy to get yourself one of these. It's called a strap wrench. Now, this one's actually giant. You can get them a lot smaller. But effectively, you can tighten them around the sleeve, and even if the sleeve is wet or you can't grip on it, you can undo them. They just simply screw in. So you let the air pressure out of your shock, undo the sleeve, and off it pops. Nice and simple. So at this stage, you could just put some fresh float fluid or shock fluid on the inside shaft here, and that's gonna make it feel nice and smooth. But if you wanna take it off, take the shock off your bike, take the whole outer sleeve off, and then you get the seal exposed, and the same things apply to your fork seals. Make sure they're nice and clean, get some fresh lubricant in there, and put it back together, and it's gonna feel amazing. But like I said, shocks are generally much better sealed, and unless they're playing up, then you pretty much don't need to do this process. Another thing that tends to suffer in wet conditions is your cable routing, especially all the way to the derailleur. Now on some bikes, you're gonna have a consistent length all the way like I have on this particular bike. It's a single length of outer all the way to the rear derailleur. So there's actually less chance of moisture being able to get inside that system. As soon as moisture does get inside there, there's friction, it can cause corrosion to the steel cable and your gears are gonna be all over the place. So it's a really good opportunity to replace or at least remove your inner cable and flush out that outer housing with some spray lube and replace that inner cable. Something I really like to do myself is use a very light spray grease on the inside of the shifter. Now it's so light that it doesn't have an effect as a thick, heavy congealing type grease would, but what it does is it makes sure that no water can stay on any of those inner moving parts and it works really, really well. So on this particular bike, I've got a full run of internal cabling, so it's actually very well sealed and doesn't need replacing at the time. But on other bikes, you're gonna find you have stops on the outside of the frame and separate lengths of outer cabling with exposed inner cable. Now they're the types that are gonna need constant attention, constant lubrication, and to a degree, constant replacement of that inner cable. It's a good opportunity to do it now because otherwise over the winter, it's gonna get progressively worse. Now it's a good opportunity as well to address your tire situation. Now, depending on your preference with your tires, you might wanna to swap to something with more tread, maybe a more open design, or even a specific mud tire like this sort of thing for your winter riding. Depends how aggressive you are and depends how bad those conditions can be. Now, typically I like quite an aggressive tire up front for steering, braking, and control. And I like something a bit faster with a little less tread on the back, so it remains a little bit faster. And that's my typical setup for most of the year. But when it comes to this time of year, I'll always swap out that faster rear tire for something with a little bit more traction on it. Now the tire run up front is a Trail King, so I'm gonna mirror that on the rear. It works pretty well in most conditions, and that's what I prefer over a dedicated mud tire. I'd rather a tire is predictable and I know what it's gonna do the whole time than something that's exceptional in one specific condition. So it's gotta suit your riding, so just take that into account. It's also a great opportunity to top up the tire sealant you have if you're running a tubeless setup, and also to take a look at those valve cores themselves because they can get pretty congealed and you'll notice this when you're finding it hard to either deflate your tires and let some pressure out, or if you're just trying to inflate them. If air's struggling to go in or the pressure gauge is struggling to read what's in there, it's probably those valve cores themselves got some clogged up old sealant on them. 
So what you want to do with those is remove them completely and clean them out. Sometimes it can be very fiddly, but it's well worth doing. Worst case, keep some spares and just pop them in and you can spend your other free time working on those valve cores with some nice fresh ones in place on the bike. Something also worth taking into account, which will save you a few quid, is if you use inner tubes or if you carry inner tubes as spare parts, when you do eventually, when the time comes to get rid of one of those inner tubes, remove the valve core, keep it as a spare because it's a universal fitment that'll fit on any new valve stems that you have between your bikes, so well worth keeping those. Something I prefer to do, instead of breaking the seal of a set of tires, if I just want to top up the sealant and make sure I've got enough to see me through winter, is to remove the valve core and apply directly using a syringe straight into the tire. It's also good because you can monitor the specific amount you're putting straight in. So we've got loads of grease applied to the bike, the suspension's running nice and smoothly. I've changed my rear tire out for a nice predictable all weather option and put some fresh tire sealant in. Now it's time to lube the chain. Now all year round I tend to use a dry lube and it's actually the lube I prefer the best. Now despite the name, dry lube comes out wet. The wet part of it itself though is just the carrier. Now the part of the chain that really needs to be lubricated are the rollers and the pins. They're the parts that contact with the sprockets. That's where all the wearing and all the rotation and movement actually happens on the part of the chain. Once you apply a dry lube, the actual wet part of it will actually sort of dry up, hence the dry part of the lube. Now this stuff's very good and it does a really good job. You have to apply it quite frequently. And of course, in wet conditions, this stuff does get washed away, which is why in winter you need to use a wet lube. Now this is very thick, viscous lube. If you use this in the summer, it's gonna attract dust and all the sort of dry stuff, trail debris to your chain and make it a right mess. This is what you need in winter because it really keeps moisture away and creates a barrier on the chain. But it's pretty messy stuff. So you need to make sure when you apply it, you apply it to a nice clean chain and you keep applying it after every few rides. Now, when you actually apply the lubricant itself, avoid applying it to the top part of the chain. It's a bit, bit of a waste, to be honest. You wanna apply it to the inner part of the rollers, straight away it gets into the place where it needs to be applied. You'll, you'll use less lubricant by doing this. The best way to do it is to cycle the chain backwards and literally try and get a drop per link as you roll past. Now this is the thicker wet lube I've just applied to the chain. Now if I was using this in slightly drier times, I would actually wait for it to sort of penetrate into the areas of the chain it needs to be, and I'd wipe off the excess. But as I'm about to go out on a really, really wet ride, I'm actually just gonna leave it as it is. Something else definitely worth bearing in mind is the state of your brake pads. Now over the course of winter, you probably will go through a set depending on the types of mud that you're riding in. Around here, I have to deal with quite sandy stuff, so it actually does destroy your brake pads. Now, although it's not worth replacing them straight away, you definitely wanna know where you are so you can guess how long you have left. So I'm just gonna remove my brake pads from the bike here and just have a little look at them. And I'll show you what they look like compared to a new set of pads, just so you can sort of bear this stuff in mind. Of course, you need your brakes on all riding, so it's a good idea to make sure you keep on top of this sort of thing. Now, there's actually, plenty of material on this set of pads here. You can see the backing plate and you can see that there's loads of material on them. But if I could just compare them to a fresh pad, look how much more material is on a fresh pad by comparison. So it's definitely worth inspecting your pads and just making sure that they're not all the way down to the metal. If they are, you're gonna need to replace them. Now, another winter essential in wet climates is having some kind of mud fender up front. Now, of course, this is not gonna keep you clean by any circumstances. You go mountain biking in winter, so you're gonna get dirty. But what it's for is to keep that stuff out of your face. And the reason that's so important, of course, it hampers your vision if you've got mud going in your eyes or in your eyewear or your goggles. And the reason it actually happens now is because as bikes have advanced, this hole here has actually got much bigger as fork travel has got longer. Back in the day when you had no suspension on a bike, your tire was right up here. And the only thing you really need to do was have some sort of down tube protector just to keep some of that low speed mud from flicking up in your face. These days, it's all about the spray that finds its way coming up here through this gap and you ride back into it basically. And that spray can be really off-putting when you're trying to ride or tackle technical terrain at speed. Now this particular mud guard is a Syncross one, it's part of the fork actually that came on my Scott. It does a really good job 
most of the year round, but actually at this time of year, I do need a bit more protection. So I'm gonna remove this and put a bigger mud guard on. Of course, this is down to preference, down to the clearance you have on your bike. And do you even want a mud guard? I highly recommend using one. The obvious ones is to have some kind of flap like this, does the same sort of job. It's a very similar size, in fact, to the Syncros one that's on there. They're very cheap, they're easy to buy. In fact, that's a GMBM one you can get from our store. But there's also much bigger fenders that look much more like the sort of thing you'd see on a motocross bike. Now these would sit, if I just slide this in place. They would sit underneath here, they catch that spray at the point that it starts flicking back and it can't go anywhere. And it's also got a deflector at the front. So any spray that does manage to make it out the front, it pushes it back onto the tire and forces it round again. These things are absolutely amazing. There's several different models available on the market. Some work better with some forks than others do, so it's well worth checking the clearance on your particular ones and seeing what's available to you. But honestly, if you're riding in wet conditions, they make such a difference and they're well worth investing in. If you can put up with the looks, of course. An additional thing that's really good for wet weather with these type of guards is the fact that they tend to deflect that water and moisture away from your fork seals. So essentially, you're keeping your forks working for better at the same time as keeping mud out of your face. Can't be a bad thing, eh? Now the final thing you really want to take into account with winter riding is the daylight hours are shorter. So chances are if you're riding at the beginning of the day, you might need some lights before you get started and vice versa at the end of the day. At the very least, get yourself some little compact lights just for your front and rear, just to make sure you can be seen on the way to or from the trails. Now these little ones, they just plug in via USB, very easy to charge, ideal if you're commuting to work, so you can charge these on your computer all day long. However, if you want to include night riding as part of your mountain biking, you're going to need some more specific kit. Now, what we tend to recommend is a helmet-based light and a handlebar-based light. Your helmet light does most of the actual hard work, but you'll find that you'll never get as much power on the helmet light as you will on something you're able to mount on the bars. There's various different options available on the market, ranging from the ludicrously expensive all the way down to the completely affordable. So you have to make a decision on what suits you best. If you want to find out a bit more about night riding, the setup, the sort of kit you're going to need to do, keep an eye out in the coming weeks from GMBN and GMBN Tech, the sort of stuff that me and Neil are going to be making. For a couple more useful tech related videos, for everything about installing tubeless setups, click right down here. And if you want to learn more about that fork lower leg service, which I promise you is well worth learning, click down here. As always, click on the globe to subscribe to GMBN Tech. We love having you around. And of course, if you like riding in winter, give us a thumbs up.